Okay. Sorry, good evening everybody. This is the Board of Selectmen meeting from Monday, November 14th, 2016. Uh, first item on the agenda is a proclamation, Arlington Recycles Week. Uh, Mr. Gordon Jamison, if you just say your name and address for the precinct. I mean, for the record. Uh, Gordon Jamison, I'm at uh, 163 Situate Street, and I'm the co-chair of the Arlington Recycling Committee. And we thank the board for, for issuing their, the annual Recycling Week proclamation. Uh, two things quickly, and then we, if you want to read it, you can go ahead. Um, one is to remind folks that we're, while we will have a recycling center at the DPW Yard this uh, Saturday, during Re Arlington Recycles Week, um, we will not be having the annual, what has been the annual fall community collection day. The next community collection day will be in the spring. And then the other thing I wanted to, uh, to help spur the residents on is to draw their attention to the recent article penned by the other co-chair uh, as part of our ongoing series Recycle Right in the Advocate. Uh, Julie Brazil penned this, where she has some uh, fun with the concept of if we all, if every household doesn't throw something out, what, it, what does it look like if you try to throw a large animal in the back of a trash truck? I particularly like the uh, one cardboard box is 7.5 tons and that, that for motivation she writes, uh, try to imagine three angry rhinos being shoved into a trash truck. <laughs> that one made me laugh. I had, I had read the article but I had forgotten that part. So uh, this, this is to remind folks that uh, we calculate that over 50% of our trash uh, that, we, that we burn um, is still recyclable or compostable. So we have a lot of work to do still. Thank you, Gordon. Um, is there a motion um, to receive? Move receipt. By Mr. Second. Greerly, seconded by Mr. Byrne. Any further discussion? Anyone here in the audience? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous aye. vote. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have the proclamation we were yeah. going to do this? We're going to read it. Do you want me to read it? Yes, if Mr. Don actually could read okay. it. I gave him that. Sorry. Or Mr. Greeley. Hmm. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Thank goodness, Mr. We're, Greeley. We're sorry. trying to do it more quickly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> proclamation. Whereas it is in the interest of Arlingtonians to help protect the environment and the natural resources of the planet by reducing our consumption of these resources and whereas... Recycling, as well as source reduction, reuse, composting, and the safe disposal of hazardous waste materials plays an important role in protecting and preserving the world's natural resources. And whereas, recycling programs also significantly reduce the annual expenses incurred by the town of Arlington in the course of its disposal of the commercial and residential solid waste generated by the town. And whereas, the bylaws of the town of Arlington state that Arlingtonians shall participate in the town's mandatory curbside recycling program, and whereas it is in the interest of the town of Arlington to educate its residents more fully about the town's recycling programs, to ensure that residents comply with town bylaws as well as state and federal regulations regarding the disposal of solid waste and hazardous materials, and more broadly to promote and encourage recycling and source reduction, and whereas the Board of Selectmen supports the efforts and recognizes the contributions of the Arlington Recycles promotional campaign as sponsored by the Arlington Recycling Committee and the Department of Public Works. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the members of the Board of Selectmen, do hereby proclaim that the period of November 14th through November 20th be declared Arlington Recycles Week in the town of Arlington. And we call upon all citizens, businesses, and civic organizations to acquaint themselves and to recognize the contributions and benefits to recycling and related efforts play in enhancing our everyday health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. And it is signed by each of us and our board administrator. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Don. so much. And as in voting, vote recycle early, recycle often. Take mm. care. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Gordon, do you want this? Do you want to take this with you? Oh, yeah. Actually, um, yes. You'll be the steward of the Excellent. proclamation. Charlie. Excellent. Mm, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks again. You're welcome. Uh, next, we have consent agenda. The minutes of the meeting of October 31st, 2016, appointment of new election workers. Margaret Fischera, Peggy, 39 Temple Street, Democrat, Precinct 8, Diane Picari, 34 Hamilton Road, number 409, Democrat, Precinct 2, Jeannie Wall, Jean Wall, 36 Udine Street, Democrat, Precinct 13. Move approval. Move approval by Mr. Burns, seconded Second. by Mr. Greeley. Any discussion? Yeah, Madam Chair, I must abstain from the, uh, the minutes of the meeting on October 31st as I was absent. Okay. First, we'll take uh, 
Uh, approval of the minutes of October 30th, 2016. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Mm -hmm. All those abstaining? Aye. 4 0 and 1. On the appointment of the new election workers, on uh, a motion by Mr. Byrne, seconded by Mr. Greeley. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstentions? Unanimous vote. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just take uh, three things out of order. First, we have under traffic rules and order and other business. A gift presentation, Congressional Gold Medal replica honoring Doolittle Toyoki Raiders. Is Chris Costello here? I apologize. I'm going to say that again. It's a gift presentation from the Congressional Gold Medal replica honoring the Doolittle Tokyo Raiders. And you are? Chris Costello. Thank you. So my name is uh, Chris Costello. I'm actually uh, the designer of the uh, Congressional Gold Medal that was presented to the Doolittle Tokyo Raiders. Um, last year and uh, I would like to present this to the town of Arlington uh, specifically so that we can uh, honor uh, Arlington town residents Eugene McGurl and Howard Sessler. Um, I designed the front of the metal and the front actually shows a design of the um, B-25 bomber taking off from the deck of the flight deck of the, um, the USS Hornet on April 18th 1942. Uh, in their, uh, the beginning of their raid on, against Tokyo, which was a direct response to the uh, Japanese uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. And the reverse uh, is actually uh, in honor of the uh, 17th Bomber Bombardment Group. Shows a uh, picture again of the B-25 bombers uh, over Japan with a French uh, motto, which uh, is translated always into danger. And it's my honor to present this to the town. Wow. Thank you. Mr. Curry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank, um, thank Chris. Chris is actually a neighbor of mine uh, and a good, good, good neighbor at that. Um, and uh, as I think a lot of us know, he's on the um, a trustee at the uh, Dallin Art Museum as well. But he's um, <clears throat> very uh, accomplished. Uh, he is uh, actually, you've designed several uh, of our uh, National Parks quarters, I believe, which are in, in circulation. And uh, he had contacted me a little while ago uh, with this generous offer of, of presenting to the town this, this, um, this uh, congressional medal that he also had the honor of, of uh, designing. Um, we both happen to live just above uh, the um, <clears throat> square uh, that, that uh, we just um, yep. voted to... Um, uh, where well, we voted to expand the memorial of the, of the Doolittle Raiders for uh, Mr. Sesson and, and, uh, and Mr. Uh, McGurl. Mm -hmm. um, and so it seemed like a, an appropriate time for, for, to uh, accept this gift uh, on behalf of the, the town, which uh, I think we can all assure that we'll, we will accept and, and place in a, in a, uh, a secure location where, where it, it can, can still be um, enjoyed. And it's a fitting tribute to, uh, to the uh, young uh, man of Arlington who served in that that campaign. Great. So, excuse me, Diane. Honor. I think Jack Johnson is also in the audience, and he's the one that recommended that this Howard Sessler get the award. He may want to say something. Okay. On Thanks a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Second. Mr. Dunn. Um, Mr. Johnson, is he here? I uh, don't see him. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, he was going to so, come to Mr. Gurley. Okay. So, uh, uh, Chris, thank you very much, and uh, um, wonderful tribute. Um, how, how wild are the parties at the Curo residence, Chris? <laughs> Did it bother you when you were he designing that? He wants you to snitch on your neighbor. Down? Actually, I, I remarked we didn't have one this year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're, not, they're not too crazy. But uh, seriously, I notice you're, you're wearing gloves to protect yes. the metal and stuff. Yes, Do you have a recommendation where you think it should be displayed, or um, has that I been worked out? I would recommend that it could be um, displayed on a stand mm -hmm. um, that could, where you can see both sides. Um, a recommendation where to show it? Yeah, where to? Uh, yeah. I had my first thought would be maybe Arlington High School. Mm -hmm. I was going to say the high school. As a possibility, the uh, give it a nice uh, feature there. Mm -hmm. so. Well, thank you very much. And they it's do, they like do it. indeed have a case there for veterans right. from Arlington mm -hmm. High School. Mm -hmm. so oh, that's where you should go. I believe mm -hmm. securely. Thank you. Well, you should you should give it to the chairman, really. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Yes. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. I, I want to thank Mr. C Costello for. Uh, keeping this issue in the forefront and recognizing those that 
didn't do anything for recognition, did it because it was a sense of obligation and commitment to uh, the community and country, uh, along with the McGurl family and all the other veterans' families who are very near and dear to here in Arlington. Um, is there anyone else who would like to speak to this? If not, a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Dunn. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks. Make sure Mrs. Kropelka will take care of this. Agenda item eight, presentation, Arlington Council on Aging Guide. Um, just name and address for the record. Mara Klein Collins, 18 Hamilton Road, apartment 502. Thank you. Jim Muncy, 215 Mass Ave, Arlington. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having us today. Um, I'm the chair of the Council on Aging Board. Jim is a vice chair. I'd also like to acknowledge a number of our, the friends of the Council on Aging, Council on Aging Board members and staff here. Hello. Thank yeah. you. God bless. <laughs> yes. Um, so why are we here tonight? First of all, we want to thank um, the town for um, the plan, the, the capital planning budget of the renovation of the senior center, the first renovation since 1980. And we really appreciate that. The seniors are very excited. And one of the things we've done as a board is we focus on advocacy. And part of what we've been doing over the last two years is educating ourselves. And what we're here to do is share the findings with you and ask for your support. Could I just ask you to talk into the microphone so oh, everyone at home sorry. can enjoy what you're saying? Okay. You, can, you can move the mic, it's fine. Okay, no, that's good. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, it's the mission statement for the council. And really what we're doing is our role is to advocate for the seniors and support the council and aging staff. And that's what we see our role as a board to do. Um, the formal mission statement is the primary, primary responsibilities that are designed, promote, and implement services to address the needs of the community's elder population and to coordinate existing services in the community. Bottom line, we advocate. Um, we have a very full board and we have two associate members. We're very fortunate. We have an internationally known expert in Alzheimer's disease. We have an elder law attorney. We have two nurses. We have a former Belmont. Per, um, staff person, we have a care manager, we have a policy person from Brandeis, we have a member of the clergy. It's a really, really great board, and um, I think we've been able to make a difference. I was on the board about 12 years ago um, as chair at that point also, and this is a very advocacy-oriented board. Um, so the next question is, who do we serve in Arlington? And if there's one thing that I can get you to take away this evening, it's the Council on Aging is the fastest growing department in the town of Arlington right now in terms of the, the constituents that we serve. So according to the Massachusetts Council on Aging, since the 2010 census, the senior population in our, has increased by 20%. So Arlington's senior population is now estimated at over 11,000 seniors in town. A senior is defined, defined by the Commonwealth as 60 and over. Um, Mass Council on Aging estimates that the overall population in Massachusetts is going to grow 12% over the next 20 years. Seniors will grow at the rate of 65% over the next 20 years. So there is a tsunami coming, and it started. The boomers are coming. Um, and we're looking at 18,000 seniors in Arlington in the next 20 years. Um, and the big question we have is, are we prepared to serve them? And I'm going to show you how we've done that and what we think. Jim's going to talk a little bit about how we're funded. Good evening, all, and it's exciting to be here. Thank you. Okay, there you go. This chart pretty much takes the budget for the town and for the Council on Aging, and it breaks it out in the blue area where it gets funding from the town. The white area are very variable funding, different funding positions, whether it's a one-time grant, CDBG. And if you look at that non-paid workers, 19% of the value of our total budget comes from volunteer hours. That's 153 hours a week that volunteers contribute so we can do our job. 
And I'd like to right now thank the volunteers for all the hard work they do because we couldn't do it without them. Now you asked us when we came on the board to be advisors and to be watchdogs. Well, I kind of look at myself as a Paul Revere. You know, the boomers are coming, the boomers are coming. <laughs> We've got to be aware of the fact that we're gonna have a snowball here and we don't want to be overtaken by it. We have so much in our shaky white area of funding that even the cut, potential cut in January from state funding due to the tax coming in may be below the estimate. So if we lose even 50 cents per head on a senior, that's costing us $5,697. If we lose a dollar a head, now we're up to $11,394 that we can't recover. So it's gonna mean cuts in services, cuts in programs, and it's just a nightmare scenario. We've got level funding in the town and the population's going like this and we're getting deeper and deeper into a hole. Next slide, please. This is taking a look at the total of the budget for the town. And roughly the schools are in that red area. The rest of the town is in the purple area. The libraries is that little sliver on the right-hand corner down the bottom. And you can't even see what the Council on Aging gets because it's so small. It's 0.15% of the town's budget. And we have a growth population that's exploding. 18 months ago when we created this chart, that figure was 0.17%. We've gone down <laughs> at two hundredths of a point here just because of the population growth having level funded. And it, it's just not going to work in the long run. The situation will only get worse unless you guys take some proactive action to help the seniors. Next slide, please. One of the big features that we provide for seniors is transportation. We have vans that are equipped with wheelchair lifts to get people out of their homes. They come to the senior center, we take them to medical appointments, we take them shopping, and the wheelchair lift becomes really critical when people not only have injuries, but as they get to the point where they can't walk by themselves without being able to climb stairs. So the wheelchair lift makes a big difference in their lives. So when transportation is running, we provide the ability for them to have mobility, to not be isolated in their homes. They have access to the community and their social aspect is tremendous. They come to the senior center for exercise programs, muscle strengthening programs, yoga, chair yoga, meals, movies, there's all kinds of events. The main reason they come is the socializing aspect of it. It gets them with people. We had a van run a couple of months ago where we filled the van with nine people, took them to someone who was legally blind who could no longer come to the exercise program, and all of her classmates came to visit her. It was just a wonderful experience. The drivers act as the eyes and ears of the Council on Aging. We hear what's going on. They ask us questions, we get them information, and in the, month, in the, the rides, they tell us what's going on. And we can sometimes say, we should have a nurse check on that person. Or maybe have a social worker make a house call. But we're, we're, we got our ears to the ground. So it's not just a ride. Next slide. So how does the COA support the town? We partner with emergency services to reduce 911 calls. Um, Susan recently told me about someone that had called, a woman that had called the, the, the emergency line 54 times in one month. And so they worked together with emergency services, got the nurse over there, got the social worker involved, got some volunteers doing friendly checks on her to make sure she was okay, and the calls have stopped. So it's saving money in other ways. Um, I came back from a, an EOEA thing for board members, and I'm all excited. Susan, there's this great idea. You can partner with the assessor's office to know who's not paying their taxes, that they might be having other issues. She's got, check it off, we do it. 
So the assessor's office will let the staff know that something's going on, you know, that somebody is having issues, and then they can go in and probe a little bit and see if they can help. And again, it's another way because there's a lot of seniors that don't come to us or adult children that aren't aware of the services, so a lot of what we're doing is outreach. So it really helps in the community. Um, and Susan can give you more examples, it's just we have to be very careful regarding HIPAA. So lastly, the, the next one is what are the needs of the seniors? So the renovation of the senior center is critical. So the funding has been added to the capital plan to make the space handicapped accessible by renovating walkways, entrances, the darn bricks, and bathrooms. Yes. Um, one of the, recently the Friends ran a road race that they run every year on, to benefit us and it started pouring in the midst of it. And I ran into the senior center with a bunch of people. There was a younger woman in a wheelchair and she asked me the, where the bathroom was and I cringed because our bathrooms aren't wheelchair accessible and she could not use, she could not transfer to use the bathroom in the senior center. So we are working with Jenny Raid, who's been fabulous, but um, Susan told me another one, another story of someone that was an instructor um, and she couldn't get the door open. So these are, these are basic needs for the senior center now, not just in a few years when we get the renovation done. And I, I can't tell you, my face was red. I was really embarrassed that day. But I use it as a way to promote the friends and how they support us. Um, we want a senior friendly building. A lot of older people have sight issues, so they need adequate lighting. We need better acoustics for hearing impaired people. And um, also to provide cues for people that have memory loss, because memory loss is, is, I think it's one in three, Paul, help me out here. One in three people will be diagnosed with memory loss. Um, and then the last thing is usable program space. So right now we have that big staircase. It's really lovely. You walk into the senior center and there's this big staircase that a lot of people can't use. Um, that's going to go away and the, the room upstairs will be reconfigured so that there'll be privacy and the rooms can get bigger and smaller so that we can run multiple programs without somebody running through one program to get to the, the restroom and then through another program. So we're, the seniors are excited. The plans are at the ground floor of the senior center and we're really excited about that. And lastly, so why are we here? What do we want? Um, can't come here and not ask for anything. So one of the things we'd really like is to have a sec selectman assigned as a liaison to the Council on Aging Board because with the growth that we're seeing, it's just gonna continue and continue and we really need to have someone that can listen and represent us with you. Secondly, we'd like your support for the Senior Center Renovation Project. It's critical right now um, to just be able to offer more programs and a safer environment. And we're also trying to attract younger seniors because seniors are gonna run the gamut. So we're gonna have the younger seniors who are healthier and we want them engaged and we want them engaged in the town. And then the last one is to increase staffing to meet the growing population of the seniors in Arlington. Um, and that's something that, would be, that Christine will be putting forward in our budget request for this year. But this will be ongoing as the numbers increase. So thank you for your time, we appreciate it. Any questions? Thank you, Mara. Um, Mr. Carroll? Sure. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, the, I've seen a slightly longer version of a similar presentation, I, I know, and the Council on Aging does a great job of, of uh, advocating for our town's um, uh, senior uh, populations. Um, I have one question, um, maybe two. Um, <clears throat> it strikes me the COA is, is an important um, safety net for, for our seniors. You know, in the past, traditionally, we had families staying close to one another, and they, they provided a, a safety net. And as our society's gotten more mobile, you know, a lot of kids move away from mm -hmm. their parents at, at that point. Um, I'm wondering if you're seeing any trends in that direction where you're having an increased need as a result of um, either children moving away from their parents or parents moving away from their children. 
I mean, recently I was volunteering on the desk and I happened to take a, a call from an, what we call in the business an adult child and had no clue of all of, she didn't live in town and had no clue of all of the things that we could do and was very relieved in talking with us. Susan, do you want to address anything on that? <clears throat> Carp? Just very briefly, Susan Carp, Director of Council on Aging. So the trends have been, they've been there um, and they are increasing, but the adult children know how to reach out to us many times. They'll use email or phone. So it, it's there, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm also wondering if you could talk a bit about um, how you partner with some of the other organizations there. I know that, that you're competing in your uses um, with you know, some of the, the, the regional senior, senior ser Minuteman senior services, I believe, comes through and, and, uh, and also they run the Meals on Wheels, I think, out of some of your facilities. Right. And if there is a kind of an exchange of information back and forth. Yeah. Well, exchanging information is very difficult because it's, it all uh, surrounds the privacy of the senior. We work together collaboratively um, to basically get, to get the end goal. Yeah. So in terms of other organizations, Minuteman Senior Services is our right arm in aging services. Uh, they deal with individuals that are on the lower income, so for home health services, Meals on Wheels, protective services. They're kind of like the, the local mothership. So they, they ha Arlington is one of the largest communities within their domain. Uh, when we need to go outside of that, um, there are some fee for service through Minuteman Senior Services, but the way that we reach out into the different communities, so there's home health aid services, there's geriatric care managers, um, you know, there's housing options. So really with the resources that we have as well as the qualified staff on hand, I mean, we have two social workers, we have a nurse, information referral, transportation volunteer. So in all areas, all resources are tapped. So I like to see the Council on Aging as a one-stop shop, if you will. Um, we're not as, we're not so much transactional, yeah. you know, pieces of what we do are transactional, but we really build our relationship with the senior as they live in the community, because our goal is to keep the senior in the community as long as it's, it's feasible. Okay, thanks. I think the last thing that I just wanted to note is I, one thing that I think sets um, the Council on Aging apart from many of our other services, except for our schools, is that there is a, 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 a population there that we can very distinctly measure with the, the growth in that population, these numbers you have with your demographic projections of, of what the growth in our senior population might be scare me a bit. I, I know that part of what we've done with the school populations is to try to set a baseline and then essentially run by, by formula based on you know, growth in enrollment. It looks like this is the approach that the state takes with their allocations to the Council on Aging and um, I know the manager is probably going to kill me for throwing this into the <laughs> into the mix, but I'm wondering if we shouldn't be thinking on some level about a similar approach on the local level. Obviously, I don't know that we've got it in our budgetary means to do um, do that to the same extent that the state does, but but obviously it's an approach that they've they've felt is is uh, is appropriate to look at a per capita um, approach based previous year's figures or whatnot. I don't know how you get the, the where you're getting your numbers from. Uh, you, you, you mentioned um, the last 2010 census and comparing that to now, so. Uh, right, the town census. So, right. the, so all of our funding through the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, so for those in the accounting, it's the formula allocation. So okay. that's based on the 2010 census. Okay. So that figure is roughly around 9,300. So that is a complaint. Um, that we all have in the Council on Aging is that we're, we're working off the 2010. We know that the, the you know, aging, you know, that, it, that it's expanding, it's exploding, but yet we're dealing on yesterday's dollars, um, probably just the same as any other municipal department. Um, and how we look at it is that the numbers, the difference in the numbers between the 94 and what you're seeing in there really is the town census. So we take a look at, we've uploaded those figures into our system and that's how we track it. Um, you know, I don't want you to walk away saying that we can't, we can't and aren't doing our jobs. We have a talented staff. We tap into every single resource that we have. Uh, we're a very high intern site. 
So we have, you know, nurse, we have six to eight nurses every semester. We have social work. We have, you know, staff that really goes beyond all. But we have really pushed the upper limit. So in terms of coming to the town just to let you know what's coming so that, you know, you can, there is no quick fix. This is just something that we've been watching. We have been building the programs because people think that we're just services, but we're program-based. We have over 85 programs a year uh, that are well attended that we meet, that we use, you know, as a means of outreach as well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this was really informative. And, you know, I'm looking at the, uh, the request that you've made um, for 2017, and I think number one's, you know, pretty straightforward, and I'm sure there will be a, you know, a, a in-depth discussion with the town manager on um, the staffing of the COA. And I'm curious um, what you would like to see us do to uh, actually, you know, support the renovation project. You know, I think that that's something we're all interested in, but I'm wondering what action steps you'd like to see us take, you know, based off that request. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> In, in looking at the feasibility study and the dollars that are projected for the project, it's going to be a lot of millions of dollars. And as those numbers surface, it's going to get scary. It's not something we can back away from. We're going to have to do it. The numbers are there. And to not do it is going to drive the balance between seniors and uh, other expenditures way out of balance. We, we need to take care of these people. They've been contributing to the town for years and years and years, and now they need some help. And that's what we're here for. Jim, if, if I just may add quickly to <coughs> that. So we know that 27 Maple Street is not the Taj Mahal that we'd really like to service all the needs. A part of the influence is that I tend to do programming throughout the community because we can't possibly draw everyone into one building physically. I mean, the, the numbers don't work. The other side of it is that not everybody wants to come into a senior center. I see 27 Maple Street as a community building. It's multiple tenants. It gives us an opportunity to bring our young into the building to, in, you know, to mingle and, and interact with our seniors gives me the opportunity to continue to program. For example, right now we've got a program running at the, with the library. So when we're talking about partnerships, it's not just Minuteman Senior Services. It's the Arlington Girls and Boys Club. It's the library. It's the recreation department. I work with emergency services. It, it, we just, we're keeping involved in the community and we're keeping the seniors in the community and they're going to the place where they're most comfortable. For some, it's their houses of worship. So what do we do? We reach out to the clergy because we, we don't want to have that parishioner, or parishioner leave their, their church or their temple. <coughs> we want to go out into the community. So with this enhancement, it enhances a municipal building. So it's not just about the senior center because the redevelopment board's got, got to rent that building off hours. So it's not just the senior center, you're improving a municipal building for multiple uses. And by day, it is the senior center. So selfishly, we're going to ask for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if it would be appropriate that we take a motion to receive, and then I will ask my colleagues in terms of a selectman liaison um, who might be interested in that. Um, and if there's more than one, two, or three, we'll have to battle it out amongst us. But I'm thinking right now, especially since we don't know the broad range and scope in terms of uh, renovations or anything else in the future, if a motion to receive by we'll receive. Mr. Second. Greeley, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Uh, is there anyone else here who would like to speak to this? Okay, uh, so what I'd like to do is take all this information in, approve the motion, and then uh, get input from my colleagues and, and talk to the town manager about a liaison and, and how that would work, and then get back to you all and move forward on, on this very, uh, inspiring uh, initiative that you put before us. So with that, um, if I hear nothing else, a motion by Mr. Greeley, seconded by Mr. Dunn. If all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very last much. Out, of, out of turn item, and then I'll go back to agenda item four, because uh, I think there are 
several people here for this, um, and then we will go to agenda item four. The revised sec selectman letter to the ZBA regarding the Oak Tree 40B application. Attorney Heim. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> the revised letter before you uh, incorporates the comments that this board made at an earlier meeting um, on the initial draft, which was composed by myself and Special Counsel Witten. Um, this revised draft uh, tries to include all of the comments and concerns that uh, each of you raised in that context and uh, has been vetted by Attorney Witten to try to make sure that we strike the proper balance between articulating the board's uh, strong opinions on this matter and respecting the uh, ZBA's you know, autonomy to uh, uh, preside over a 40B application. I'll be happy, to I'd be happy to answer any questions, but I've highlighted in blue, I understand it's not the heaviest contrast that I could, uh, the really substantive changes, there were a few um, stylistic changes that were made uh, for the purposes of consistency. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Mr. Dunn? Um, I definitely like this draft. It's uh, something I can support. I'd um, like to uh, move, appro move approval that we sign and send this. Second. Uh, um, this, the key points in here that are, I'm the most passionate about that, are, that, are, that I think are pretty well said are, uh, one is that we have the, I really encourage the ZBA to pay attention to the wetlands and pay, hammer that point because I think that um, the wetlands issue is the, one of the biggest things that should be driving what we consider about construction on the Mugar property. And the second point is that in this, it gets into later in the letter, how important it is that the ZBA um, reach its decision carefully and justly and according to the letter of the law. This is one of those things where it's not just what you say, but exactly how you say it that's going to matter. Um, I think we all expect that this is going to end up in a lawsuit and that this, the ZBA's decision is going to be the center of that lawsuit and we could win or lose what was best for the town if with a, with a you know, not artfully crafted result. And so I'm glad to encourage the ZBA on those two points and I'm happy to support this. A motion by Mr. Dur Dunn, seconded by Mr. Byrne. Um, I just want to, before I ask you if there's anyone here that would like to comment from this from the audience, um, I am very cognizant, especially by um, Mr. Greeley's point, that this is just an informative letter to the Zoning Board of Appeals, the ZBA, ultimately, or pen penultimately, it's um, their decision as it should be under the laws, rules, and regulations that govern, govern the ZBA. Um, I would say for myself personally, and probably would um, take some leeway that my colleagues would agree that echoing Mr. Dunn's comment regarding uh, the many blanket, in my opinion, blanket waivers um, that Oak Tree is asking for regarding the wetlands, bylaws, and reg regulations um, that they should not be granted. They have submitted a project that has kicked in um, that those uh, Bylaw and regulations now stipulate that uh, there are traffic and environmental impacts um, and that uh, the comprehensive permit that Oak Tree 40B um, has submitted to us um, does require in a Mass General Law, I don't know if it's 53 or I'm not going to say that thing because I'm going to get wrong, but that they do hire experts, um, which is uh, afforded to us under the law is written and is something we should avail ourselves of, but ultimately is the Zoning Board of Appeals determination uh, to do that. And then the other thing, just my own personal uh, opinion, the comprehensive permit that has been submitted um, by Oak Tree um, as has been crafted in the letter is extremely um, incomplete in terms of what it is they are proposing, what the impacts will be, and what backup information data that they use to substantiate that. They're basically saying, uh, in my opinion, here's the application. Uh, we have nothing to back it up. It's something we've submitted for several years now, and we just want to move forward on that and let us do it. And uh, one of the things that I think we're all uh, in agreement with is um, affording uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals in their discretion and their opinion um, in terms of waiving or not waiving um, uh, wetlands, bylaw regulations, uh, traffic, environmental, et cetera, that 
since this project has been submitted, it has kicked in those, uh, it has kicked in those, um, what am I trying to say? It has kicked in those points so that these can be required and it's up to ZBA to require that and I would ask them to, to pursue that. And I think our letter says that as an advisory tone, um, recognizing that we can't direct them to do that. So I, I wanna thank attorney Heim um, and our town manager on, on behalf of our co my colleagues that we really have had a lot of debate about this and we've um, made a lot of changes and uh, edifications to it. Um, I think this is the best tool that we can provide to the Zoning Board of Appeals as an advisory letter um, to allow the process to continue legally and lawfully as it should. Um, so I do have a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Byrne, but I wanna ask if there's anybody here, Mr. Rearig and anyone else, if you'd like to come up to the microphone and say your name and address for the record. Anyone else can probably know everybody's names, but we're just doing it for the record. You are. Understood. <laughs> uh, Brian Rarick, 28 Academy Street. Um, I wanna thank the board for taking the action that it's taking tonight. And um, uh, Selectman Dunn and, and um, Selectman Mahan have, have hit on a couple of the things that I'd like to emphasize. Um, first of all, it, it's important, I think, that you're doing this because it's important that you remind everyone um, the, of the background of this site and this project. Um, the, um, the town has long ago determined that the environmental values of this site, the environmental importance, and, and the threat that um, the town faces, that residents and, and downstream property owners face, if this site is developed, outweigh any other considerations of development on, on the, the bulk of the site, the lowlands of the site. Um, it's, I think, very useful that you remind um, everyone that that is the reason that it's town policy that is supported by town meeting votes, by the open space plan, by the master plan. And I think it's useful to remind all of us of that, town staff, other boards, um, and the public, including the residents of East Arlington and landowners downstream outside of East Arlington in Medford and Somerville that, that you have their backs on this. Um, but secondly, I think it's also important that you're doing this because you're recognizing what the role of the zoning board is here. And I mean, I think this board knows that I've advocated for some decades for the protection of, uh, of most of this site. Um, I, I hear even my allies in this sometimes um, referring to this process, the 40B process, as if it were any other permitting process, like a special permit in front of the planning board, or the redevelopment board, to which the board could um, impose its opinions and has wide latitude to say yes to certain things and no to other things. Um, the zoning board has a playbook to follow here, prescribed by the state under 40B. And if we, I speak for myself, um, both expect that the outcome, as, as Dan said, will be litigation over this, and hope that the eventual outcome is that the, there's a recognition that the environmental concerns outweigh everything else. The only way that's going to prevail is if the zoning board does an extremely careful and thorough and diligent job of reviewing everything that's put before it. If, for example, I agree with uh, what the chair said about the, uh, the application that was submitted as a sham. It's a, it's a vehicle to start a conversation and get some other issues, specifically the one and a half percent resolved. Um, the zoning board can't simply say this is a sham. Go away, come back later. They have to address it under the rules of 40B. And so I, I hope that we will all no one should ever see the zoning board as a bad guy in this process. They are our defense by doing a really thorough, diligent, diligent job, even if it appears that they're giving this process more credence than it deserves. Because at the end of the day, 
it needs to have been a carefully managed process in order to give us a chance. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whalen. Anyone else? Thanks. Thank you. My name is Parul Vakani. I live at 2 Mott Street. And I'll let my fellow cohorts introduce themselves before I talk to her. <laughs> Elaine Light, Dorothy Road. Hi, Elaine. And Shona Gibson, Mary Street. And Shona. Oh, Hannah Miller, Bush. <coughs> um, so thank you for having us tonight. I just wanted to let you know that we represent the 783 members of the Coalition to Save the Mugai Wetlands. <coughs> and we wanted to thank you for your efforts and your service to the town. Your creative input into what the master plan might be for this town and recognizing that the development that they're proposing on the wetlands does not fit into that plan. So we are here, we support that position and we're here to let you know that, that we're here to also support you as you go through this process. And if you, if the need should arise, we'd be here to help. Um, if you need to contact us, you can always get in touch with myself. Um, any of these people who are here, George Late, Clarissa Rowe, and we're all in contact with each other to be able to mobilize this group of people. Over the next few months, we have plans to bring awareness to the community on a local level, um, both within the East Arlington neighborhood, but then also broadly within Arlington. So we just wanted to let you know what we're planning on doing. So thank you, though. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Gurley. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your citizen activism and for being smart enough to listen to Brian Rarig and George Late back there. <laughs> but I'm wondering where uh, Squaw Sachem is, Elsie Fiore, how's she doing these days? Do you know, because she would be here. Yes, you know, she uh, would be here. Somebody in the back row, mate. Yeah. <laughs> is she? Yeah. Oh, oh her Peter. son is back there. Peter, hi. <laughs> She's good? She's good? Okay, good. So I met with Clarissa last night, and she said, yes, she would be wholeheartedly involved in this, but uh, she's not able to move around all that much. But she's, not, she's not gone yet, though. So <laughs> that was what I was told. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else from the audience? If not, um, on a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Byrne, uh, with all the changes in um, edifications that we suggested, if we're all satisfied with that, I'll take a motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Have those opposed, unanimous vote. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. We will now go back to agenda item four. Oh, sorry, I have to pull it up. Um, Hearing for Arlington Liquors, Inc., DBA Arlington Liquor, doing business as Arlington Liquors, 94B Summer Street, uh, Alexander Kushnerski, Manager President, uh, Attorney Heim, and we are going to speak about a violation of Mass General Law 204, CMR 205, Section 2. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will try to be as succinct as I can tonight. Uh, I'll ask everyone to bear with me while I just outline the process briefly. The issue before the board tonight is whether or not Arlington Liquors violated the terms of its license on or about February 26, 2016, by allowing an illegality on its premises in violation of Chapter 138, Section 34, and 204 CMR, Section 205, Subsection 2. In this specific circumstance, by an employee or manager possessing and using marijuana on the premises of a package store. To find the violations in this instance, there must be clear weight of the evidence that marijuana was possessed on the premises of Arlington Liquors, located at 94 Summer Street, by a manager or an employee of the store. I pause to note that this matter is not about marijuana use or possession generally, but specifically about its use and possession by persons operating an establishment which sells alcohol pursuant to a license issued and monitored by this board. Finally, while not, as a, while not a formal proceeding, or at least a formal proceeding as one would find in a court of law, this hearing is being recorded by ACMI and will afford both the town and the license holder the opportunity to present evidence and testimony similar to that which be provided in a more formal uh, proceeding. Uh, the order of the proceeding shall be as follows. A summary of the alleged violation by town council, myself, on behalf of the town. The testimony of Officer Scott Urquhart with questions from the board if the board deems fit. Any testimony or evidence with Mr. Kuznirski or his counsel, Attorney Vincent Panico Esquire, wishes to provide. Questions uh, from the board for Mr. Kuznirski or his counsel. A recommendation of town council should this board uh, find any violations occurred. And then finally, a board vote on 
the presence of a violation and what, if any, suspension, revocation, or modification of the license is appropriate. There are two primary sources of evidence in this matter uh, from the town's perspective, the testimony of Officer Scott Urquhart, who has uh, been generous enough with his time to be with us tonight, um, and the police department incident report provided both to the board and the license holder. As a summary of the incident, on or about February 26th, 2016, at approximately 9 p.m., Officer Scott Urquhart and Sergeant Gregory Flavin of the Arlington Police Department responded to a call for medical assistance at 94 Summer Street in Arlington, known as Arlington Liquors. Upon arriving, officers rendered aid to the license holder, Mr. Kuznirski, and in the process of rendering such aid, discovered uh, 60 milligrams of an edible marijuana product, uh, which was recovered from his person. Uh, Mr. Kuznirski also admitted to consuming mar marijuana to Officer Urquhart. Subsequent investigation revealed that at the time of the incident, Mr. Kuznirski did not possess a medical marijuana patient card, though I expect he will provide some testimony and evidence um, explaining some of the circumstances um, in his uh, defense. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call Officer Scott Urquhart for brief testimony. Just your name for the record. That's it. Officer Scott Urquhart. Thank you. Thank you, Officer Urquhart. Can you please summarize your employment history with the Arlington Police Department? Been a patrolman with the Arlington Police Department for eight years. And as part of your professional development or training, are you trained to recognize illicit drugs? Yes, we are. Can you please describe that training? Uh, both through the original police academy, 26-week police academy, before getting on the job, as well as yearly annual in-service training. Officer, on the evening of February 26, 2016, did you have an occasion to respond to the premises known as Arlington Liquors? Yes, I did. Can you please summarize the nature of your response to such premises? The response was for a medical emergency. Uh, myself and Sergeant Flavin responded. Uh, upon arriving on scene, we rendered aid to Mr. Kushnarski um, during a cursory search of his person. A small package of medical marijuana was located. I was able to speak with Mr. Kushnarski quickly before he was uh, ultimately transported by Arlington Rescue. Um, and this took place inside the premises known as Arlington Liquors, is that correct? Correct, it did. It took place in a back office. In your experience in training, was the possession of this marijuana product a violation of general laws, including Chapter 94C, Section 32L? Yes, it was. Did you make any arrests or issue any citations in this matter? No, we did not. And why not, sir? Um, as a general rule of thumb with the Good Samaritan law, anything like that, any medical emergency that comes in, um, a cursory search is done for our protection. Um, anytime illegal substances or anything like that is found, we seize them, we document them, but in order to keep people, to keep calling for help, Good Samaritan, reaching out to 911, not trying to deal with it themselves, we generally do not cite or arrest for those violations. Thank you, sir. And did you commit your response that evening and your subsequent findings uh, in APD incident report 16004573? Yes, I did. And is everything in that report, to your knowledge, accurate? Yes, it is. I have no further questions for Officer Urquhart, but I uh, open it to the board if they have any uh, additional questions for the officer. Um, if I could um, ask Officer Urquhart, um, when you initially um, responded to the scene, and were directed to <clears throat> the uh, male individual known of, as Mr. Kuchansky. How did you observe him initially? Was he responsive? Was he con conscious? Was he talking? Uh, initially, his eyes were slightly open. He had shallow breathing. He was unable to respond to any of my questions. Um, shortly thereafter, he became completely unresponsive and uh, shallow breathing began. Okay, um, and um, I believe when you encountered the scene, there was a fellow employee there, Mr. Ivanov. Um, did he give you any, any indication as to the state of Mr. Uh, Ker, I'm gonna say it wrong again, Krasinski in terms of being able to uh, communicate with him or what state he was in? Um, he stated he contacted 911 because he was a, unable to communicate or have uh, Mr. Krasinski respond. Okay. And, and it's my understanding that um, when you and or other officers on the scene were attempting to wake up um, Mr. K 
Kersnitsky initially that was not successful or? Correct. Correct. Um, at some point, did it become successful? And if it did, was there something that was uh, implemented that or was the uh, reason for that? Um, eventually, it was. Uh, he did. He was able to speak with us. He was able to, um, his breathing returned. He was able to communicate with us. Okay. Um, at some point, was this individual treated with any kind of, I'm going to say, anti-opioid, uh, narcane, et cetera, um, which allowed him to regain his consciousness, just in your professional opinion? He was treated with a uh, two milligram dose of narcan. Okay. Um, once he was uh, treated with that, was he then somewhat or totally conscious and able to communicate with you? Correct. Completely conscious, uh, able to speak coherently. So in your opinion, just being on the scene, that the administration of what I would call knock-in seemed to have the desired effect, and he was able to communicate from that point forward? Correct. Okay. Um, from that point forward, did uh, he make any statements regarding um, what brought him to this state, um, the administration of Arcan or anything else to that point? Uh, Ms. Kunersi stated to me that he had consumed marijuana that evening, and he believed that that was the reason for the state he was in. Okay. And, and after the administration of Narcan, did you notice any physical effects um, of that administration, i.e., uh, nausea, vomiting, uh, or any other requests as a result of that? Vomiting. Vomiting. Okay. Um, I think you indicated that you did check the premises and, and the person, and uh, what was retrieved was? Um, it was a small package, I believe 60 milligrams, of a synthetic edible marijuana. Okay, and um, did you uh, question this individual on anything that he may have consumed in terms of pills, opioids, marijuana, and if so, what response did he give to any of those, whether it was Parkinson's pills, marijuana, or any other substance? He stated that he had only consumed marijuana that evening. Okay, and um, after this uh, conversation with the individual, what medical treatment was he afforded? Was he transported somewhere else, or was it deemed that the NACAN administration was uh, appropriate and, and enough that needed to be done and we could leave him at the scene? He was transported um, pursuant to Mass General Law Anytime Narcan is administered, whether um, you know it was actual opioid overdose or not, anytime um, Narcan is administered, it's a mass general law that the party must be transported to a hospital. So he was transported uh, via Arlington Rescue. I'm not sure which hospital. Okay. And my last question would be: If you have this information, uh, approximately what time, um, Mr. Kurnerski uh, reported for? work that night, what time the incident was um, called in, and what time the medical uh, initiatives or preventative measures were taken and when the scene was closed out, when he was transported? Um, if, yeah, if I Approximately. Look at the report, I, don't need... I know the 911 call came in at 9.02 p.m. Okay. Um, if you allow me, I believe in here we have... Um, we had a employee of the business state that he observed Mr. Kushnerski enter the business at approximately 18.30 hours, which is 6.30 6 p.m., 6 30. Okay. and go directly to the rear office, which is the office where I found him. Okay, and then the what I would call sort of the sign-out time when he was transported from the um, scene would be approximately... I do not recall exactly when. Um, okay. My best guess would be, um, you know, within 15, 20 minutes. Of the call. It was a relatively short investigation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, any of my colleagues, any questions right now before I call on um, any representatives from Arlington Liquors, Inc.? Um, Mr. Byrne? I, I actually don't have a, a question, just a, just a comment on uh, the overall policy. One, I want to thank you for your response that night, and, and I do think it's, um, really important that the public knows that, you know, if, if there is an issue and someone's, you know, 
um, needs assistance that they can call and you know they won't face um, you know criminal penalties and I think that's a, a real big message that we have to share and we will continue to share and I thank you and you know all your colleagues for your leadership on that and um, yeah I hope that if the, someone does need help that you know they'll call the town they'll call the police department the health department and I know that you know we can help to provide the services they need to you know get through a rough patch and I hope that people will continue to you know take advantage of that so thank you thank you Mr. Greeley? Yeah, so, you know, uh, thank you for your professionalism and how, how well you've handled uh, this for us. Um, w but there was another employee on at the time, am I right? He wasn't actually working. Um, Correct. Uh, there right. were, uh, I believe, two other, um, at least two other employees at the time. Mr. Krishnerski was not working behind the counter or, uh, in any capacity like that. Mm -hmm. Good job. Thank you. Okay, um, if uh, town council and my colleagues and the town manager uh, tell me elsewise, elsewise, is there anyone here on behalf of Arlington Liquors, uh, Mr. Kersnerski or attorney? If you could just say your name and address for the record. Hello. Vincent Panico, I'm an attorney at 2343 Mass Ave in Cambridge, right across from Frank Steakhouse, and I represent the Arlington Liquors. Uh, I've already told counsel uh, that uh, I have discussed this with my client and pointed out if he kept that piece of candy on the premises for two minutes, he was in violation. So there's no, no defense to the violation. I'd just like to give um, a little background the uh, Mr. Kuznerski, uh, when he was 12 years old, he had surgery on his stomach. He was born with his intestines in the wrong place, and he has a 14-inch scar on his stomach, and it was supposed to correct the problem. It never did. He's been in pain ever since. The, interestingly, he was, so, so he did take some stuff, it did mix with his medication. And the only good thing that has happened is he now has a marijuana card. And he said, since that time, he's been fine. And it's too bad it didn't turn up years ago because it would have saved him a lot of pain. The, uh, all, all I'm asking is to consider some mitigation here. I know that the council has probably apprised you of the three considerations that you should consider when applying any punishment here. One is, were there any criminal charges? Was there any criminal record? Was there any risk to the public? Well, as the officer has told you, he, really, he wasn't working that night. He came by to go in the back room to go over some papers, and that's the last thing he remembered. Whatever he was taking hit him, and he was out. And was there any disorder or Ill illegality that took place? And so far as we know, there was none. So I would ask you to uh, take into consideration he is in violation of the law, period. I can't come up with anything. I, I tried to think of something, but there was nothing I could come up with. Um, and I'd like, you to, I'd like you to hear from him directly about his experience and uh, what happened. Mr. Kuczynski. Uh, Alexander Kuczynski, Five Shaker Hill Lane, Woburn Mass. Uh, first of all, I'd uh, like to thank the officer for uh, responding. And, uh, basically saving my life, I believe. Um, I should have had my marijuana card beforehand. Um, I've been dealing with something, you know, something I was born with and uh, I've had three operations since. And uh, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I was, in you know, I was in my whole life in a tough place, dealing with a lot of pain and I had a lot of options how to deal with it without um, um, being addicted to anything. And um, 
on the path that I'm now and the way things stand now, I'm at the best point in my life as far as dealing with my, with my physical issues. Um, would you guys like to see the scar at all? <laughs> no. Okay. no, I could show you lots of scars myself, so okay, we great. won't go yeah, there. So, um, We're going to take this very serious. Hard, thank you. Said, and respect your privacy. Go okay, ahead. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, you know, I'm at the mercy of this panel of what happened, and I take full responsibility, and I'm sorry, I apologize for the way things worked out. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to direct the questions to Attorney Heim, and if you feel I should, uh, and it is appropriate legally, HIPAA, et cetera, uh, to direct them to Mr. Kershnisky, I will. Um, I'm not minimizing any sort of medical issues um, that you are experiencing. I think I'm confident everybody on this board is extremely cognizant of that um, and has experienced that. Um, in their family, friends, um, relatives, et cetera. Um, am I correct, Attorney Heim, that Mr. Kuznerski is the manager of Arlington Liquors on 94B Summer Street? So uh, that is correct, Chairman, but I, I also think that if you want to ask questions directly to uh, Mr. Kuznerski and his counsel, you, you may certainly oh, do so. Why, why don't I ask them sure. and just ask them for a three second pause and if there's anything I should not be asking, if either counsel um, could Note that to me. So, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kuznerski. Are the are you the manager of 94B Arlington Liquors Inc.? I am. Um, did you apply before this board uh, in that position? I did. Um, are you also the president of Arlington Liquors Inc. DBA Arlington Liquors? I am. Um, did you also apply before this board also in that position? Yes, I did. Um, this is where I'm going to look to Learned Council to uh, guide me on this. Um, I understand um, under your own volition through your uh, attorney counsel, you have disclosed to us uh, regarding um, some previous medical history that you had uh, regarding your stomach or esophagus. Um, abdominal. Abdominal, okay. Um, it, you, I think believe it's also been indicated that um, there was a medical marijuana card applied for. Is it appropriate that I ask when in relation to February, is it 26, 2016? Is that yes, the date? Sure. Is it appropriate for me to ask when in relation to February 26, 2016 that was applied for? Yes, ma'am, sure. If I could just ask you when you applied for that? Yes, um, I applied with that. Um, um, you can say approximately. Approximately. I would say beginning of spring. So uh, April, May, 2016. Yes. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't not think it was March. I do believe it was May, April. Okay, and um, I definitely take with all sincerity your uh, counsel's remarks regarding uh, leniency and um, appealing to this board in terms of um, any uh, penalty, et cetera. Uh, that it may issue, I, I, I'm cognizant of the fact as stated that regarding charges, record, and risk to the public, um, I will say I don't totally accept <clears throat> that you just happened to be there <clears throat> and this unfortunate event happened. You are the uh, manager and president of this uh, corporation uh, to which we have issued the license and to me, uh, along with, you know, managers, whether it's the Knights of Columbus or, uh, uh, or all alcohol license, it, you kind of rise to a higher level. And when you place yourself on a scene, um, I don't believe you're just there, in my opinion, in terms of any medical conditions that you may have and, and trying to work through those, um, you were and are the manager and president of this corporation, so in my opinion, you sort of rise to a higher standard. Um, I will hear from my colleagues in terms of what they think, if anything, um, should come forth uh, f from this issue, uh, but I don't think you're not culpable at all. I think, um, there's other information that has not been redacted in the police report that as a court reporter I could publicly go into, but there's really no point to that in terms of uh, one of the 
fellow employees, I want to say Aminoff, Imanoff, I'm not going to say this right. Uh, Ivanoff. Okay. Um, some other statements that that individual made, but I don't see where that really furthers, furthers this conversation any further. But I do think there was a serious offense here, as you are the manager and the president, uh, to which we have um, granted this license. And I think, and my colleagues can uh, say if it's different, but I think we're pretty clear and reticent in terms of uh, the import and the seriousness when we give out these licenses to basically the top person um, that is overseeing that. And I think at its best, there was a, an extreme uh, lapse in judgment and professionalism. Um, but thankfully, um, due to the actions of Officer Urquhart um, and the EMS and other responders, um, this worked out um, to a good resolution. And I believe you have now uh, demonstrated some steps after that to address your own medical situation, which I don't want to go into more than we have before us because of HIPAA and it's your privacy. But I do think um, this is a very serious offense and there needs to be some sort of penalty um, meted out from it. Because I'm chair, I can't say what I think it should be unless my colleagues ask me for guidance, but I'm going to first see if there's anyone else here that would like to speak to any of the points? Attorney, wait, I wrote your name down, I apologize. Attorney Panico? Panico? Come to the microphone. Uh, my remarks were only directed to the, the fact, for whatever it was worth, that he, there were other employees running the store. He, he was not working the store, but you are correct. Overall, he's responsible for whatever happens there. He's the person that owns it. He's the manager. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Kiro? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I actually had a question about that because I, I know, attorney, you said that there was no disorder as a result of this, but I, I, it seems that this would have been a great distraction for the employees on duty. So do I understand there were two employees on duty at the, uh, at the store? Right, at the, uh, it was three. I'm sorry? Uh, three employees. Three employees. So um, I, I see two noted in the police report. So. Two were, uh, can I direct a question to Officer Ur Urquhart? Officer Urquhart? I, I see two no noted here who were spoken with. Um, was that the observation of, of the APD that? Yeah, I don't recall. Come, oh, sorry, there. sorry. Can you come to the microphone? Yes. I apologize. <clears throat> I do not recall that evening, um, you know, being nine months later, how many were actually working. Okay. Um, I may have just put the ones that I spoke directly with and got statements from as, you know, quoted statements in the report that uh, select one Mahan didn't want to speak to, but if they gave a direct quote, they were included in the report. Right. There may have been a third who uh, didn't provide any information, so therefore he was not added. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, officer. The reason I ask is because obviously this would be a, a lot of um, disruption within, within the uh, business at that time. Um, it appears that, you know, two of the employees were you know, working with the, the uh, police department and, and uh, giving them information both in the response, the medical response and in the, uh, the follow-up. So my question is, during that time, was the establishment closed? Who was monitoring the, the, the customers, serving the customers or, or, or whatnot? Um, um, so who was in charge? There, there, there was uh, another employee who was in charge. I'm not sure if they closed. I, um, I don't remember a lot from that night. Okay. But um, I, I'm not sure if they closed the store for a certain amount of time while all of this commotion was going on. Or um, the, one of the guys just got on the register and ran things. And maybe if we could ask Officer Uruquat if he observed um, during this incident unfolding whether there was a permanent temporary closing of the store whether business was conducted or whether you're not sure um, I think for the most part with the multiple police cruisers the ambulance the fire truck most people stayed away um, I do remember one individual attempting to walk in at which time Sergeant Flavin did advise him that listen there you know <coughs> We were closed temporarily or, you know, that he would have to leave for the time being when we uh, conducted our investigation. Uh, the doors were never locked. There was no sign ever put up, but okay. uh, one person did come in, Sergeant Flavin, and uh, spoke with. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, officer. The establishment then 
resumed business. You must know this from following up with your employees. The yes. establishment resumed business after the incident was, yes. was passed. Okay. Um, those are all my questions. I just want to say just in general, I, I've had some concerns here. This isn't pertinent to this particular hearing, but I, I do want to, while well, we have the opportunity to speak with you here, um, you know, we do have certain expectations that we place on license holders, you know, in addition to upholding the law, it's also abiding by other regulations um, of, of the town and such. And I know that we've spoken to you in the past about the upkeep of the property. We received another complaint today about, about that. So we just want to make sure you're aware of those types of complaints. Um, <clears throat> and I'm also aware that there have been issues with another board in town over um, uh, sales, underage sales of tobacco products. My understanding is that yes, you that served penalties on that. On that. So my, my understanding is it was twice. Is that um, yeah, um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Okay. Maybe, it, maybe it was twice, but um, if I can wait, should I speak about that? Can I speak about That's that? That's fine. I just you, you can speak about it if you actually know what it is as the manager and president of the corporation. I mean, <coughs> you can speak about it no matter what, but I would expect as manager and president of the corporation, you know if it was once or twice. We believe it's twice. It, it, was, it was twice over a three-year period. Okay. I, I only put that out there because obviously these particular licenses, as you know, are in very high demand in, in, in the town. So we hold the establishments to a very high um, um, expectation when, when, when we grant them. So, um, and I think part of the conditions that we place on the license is abiding by all other regulations and laws. And we're here tonight because of the, the, the legal um, situations. I just wanted to make sure that you were able to hear that directly from us rather than third party. And, and if I could, um, and again, I'm going to look to the town manager and town council on this. <clears throat> I've had conversations before and after this incident where issues have been brought to my attention regarding employees, and I'm not saying you specifically, Mr. Kuchnarski, because um, I was never given names or descriptions. But before and after this incident, it was brought to my attention by at least half a dozen Arlington residents um, concerning employees and their conduct and or uh, medical, I don't wanna say stature, but it was brought to my attention that people have gone into this particular business and have questioned um, employees exactly in terms of sobriety or anything else. I know there's, there's talk in the police report that I won't, necessarily go into but it wasn't just THC marijuana there was you know some other talk about prescription pills etc after this was brought when it gets to me by like four or five six times I did go in um, probably a year year and a half ago my mother was smoking then she no longer is um, to get a pack of cigarettes um, and did relay um, to some town uh, department heads afterwards that I had gone in the um, employee uh, behavior that other people had pointed out to me. I'm not a medical professional, you know, no blood tests or anything were taken, but it was extremely questionable when I went in to get a, one pack of Cool Super Long. Um, I, I do want to bring it to your attention that I have heard that, um, that and it's been substantiated because I, I went in one night, it was probably 10 o'clock on a Friday night, and I seriously questioned um, the two employees, which you were neither one of them, because I do remember they were in their early 20s, and I'm gonna say you're not in your early 20s, and I don't recognize you from going in that night, but I, I certainly, the, the concerns that were raised to me when I went in that night, um, as well as the subsequent conversation that was initiated by the two employees behind the counter to me, sort of substantiated um, what I was being told. I'm not saying it's the truth, um, and I did have conversations even before this incident as well as afterwards. Um, but there are uh, some Arlington residents that have brought it to my attention even before this incident. Um, what, uh, as a result of this incident, what uh, policies, protocol, procedures, not only for yourself but your employees, have you put in place or maybe you haven't put in place um, that you will in the future because 
I've heard some very serious concerns, and when I walked in that night to buy that one pack of cigarettes for my mom, um, again, I'm, I'm not a professional, but I'm a court reporter. I had some very serious concerns, but didn't act any further on them because I really had no legal capacity to do that, but I was extremely concerned when I did go into the store that night on a Friday night. Um, just to backtrack a little bit, um, to address the situation of the tobacco underage sale, um, that employer was, uh, gone, went through a re-education re process, and uh, when I did not feel like they responded, they were let go. Um, in, the, in, the, in the past, in Arlington here, I also have dealt with um, some employee theft, and uh, those employees were let go as, as well. Um, hopefully those are the guys that you saw. And um, I just want to make it clear, the issue wasn't the sale of cigarettes. I understand. It was the, the ambiance of demeanor the and yes. cognizance and I don't want to say sobriety, I can't think of the name, but the right word for that. Um, but I, as an owner manager, I don't tolerate any of that things and, it, and if okay. I come in contact with that with my employees, it's, uh, it's a very serious. Okay. And people have been terminated for, okay. again, I suppose it's the nature of the beast, but for, for that, they've been terminated for, con for stealing alcohol and consuming alcohol on the premises. And I appreciate you being here, and I apologize if I overstepped in my questioning in terms of um, the queries I had for you. Mr. Greeley? Well, I'm really uh, tossed on this because we have separate issues here. I mean, the, if we believe, and I have no reason not to at this point, the medical issues, and now uh, that you do have the medical card, have we seen it? I have it on me, would you like to see it? I wouldn't mean anything to me. Would you know, would you recognize it, Scott? Would you know what this is? I would not, in my time, I'd never come across it. Okay, would you, like you to have it? it, I believe you, okay. okay. Um, and the, but then we have these other issues in terms of um, the other things beyond the tobacco, the signage, the ripped uh, awning. Is that still out front? I haven't. Thank you very uh, much. So the overall general, um, uh, you know, but that's re related to license renewal. And I, I, so I don't, you know, I, I'm just not quite sure what to do. It sounds like there was no harm other than to himself that night. It's very dangerous wrong, shouldn't have been inside the, uh, the uh, marijuana should not have been inside the store. Um, but um, I, don't, I don't know if any of my colleagues have a specific uh, recommendation here, but it seems to me something along the lines of a probationary period in terms of his behavior, and then uh, some sort of a, uh, um, uh, a spelling out specifically what we want done before we will renew his license in terms of signage, in terms of, so I'm just throwing that out there. If, if I could throw out, um, this gentleman is the uh, manager and president of the establishment. He arrived, I believe, approximately two and a half hours before the incident, um, before the medical emergency call was called into Arlington 911, which successfully, um, as a result of Narcan, uh, resuscitated the individual, which he, a month or two later, obtained the medical marijuana card um, for, as he and his attorney states, a, a previously existing condition, but that was no condition and no card was obtained when he applied as president and manager um, for this. It's not like he just popped in. He was there for two and a half hours. He is the manager and the president of, of, of Arlington Liquors on Summer Street. Um, to me, looking at our own, um, even though, uh, and I appreciate the Arlington Police Department in uh, providing aid and uh, not going over and above exorbitantly uh, placing any charges, whether they were uh, warranted or not, um, in my opinion, the manager president has violated, at the very least, the trust um, of this board, if not the spirit, if we look at our alcohol rules and license in terms of um, you, you're not just a cashier, who, you're the manager president. Um, to me, uh, I believe Mr. Uh, Kershnitsky violated the Board of Selectmen's uh, rules and regulations on when we in, 
uh, approved you as the manager president um, for this uh, business on 94B Summer Street. And I would say the minimal uh, uh, penalty that I would suggest that we uh, give to this manager president who is overseeing this business, um, besides the other violations that we're bringing to his attention that we brought before and have not been addressed, um, and I suspect maybe they will after tonight, maybe they won't, but even putting that aside, um, the violation of the trust when this Board of Selectmen gave you that all alcohol license, which includes delivery, and you are the manager president who was there for two and a half hours, that um, if I had my druthers, there would be a three-day suspension starting on the same day of the week that this uh, violation occurred, which happened to be a Friday. Um, and also citing the previous concerns that residents had brought before me, and I did go in on a Friday night. It was not this president um, manager that was there that night, but the other two employees, I wouldn't say rose to the need for medical care that this individual did that night, but I certainly had some questions. So I would just put that before my colleagues that I think the minimal in a case in point scenario that's before us tonight would be a three day suspension um, beginning on the same day of the week that this violation occurred. So I'll just put that out. Mr. Dunn. Mrs. Mahan has repeated the facts of what's going on and I agree with her assessment of the facts. But I think I'm definitely on board with uh, Mr. Greeley's general recommendation and feeling on this. Um, I, I think that I am I'm very happy with what the actions the police department took that night and took in the conversations of working with Attorney Hyman coming here and I appreciate the, the work that everyone's done and I appreciate that we're here. I'm glad that we're having this conversation. Um, but I don't think that um, a three day suspension is a, a punishment that fits the crime. And so I know um, Attorney Heim had earlier, when he indicated the process, had talked about possible um, you know, results of this. And so I'll say that I'm ready to say, like, I, I, would, I would make a motion that says, yes, I find uh, the, the violation occurred. And I would make a recommendation of a, of a probationary period, even up to a year or something like that. Something along the lines of working with the town manager, the Board of Health, and uh, any other bodies that the manager thinks or, or uh, thinks are, is appropriate, um, but I don't, I don't want to jump the gun in case Mr. The Attorney Heim is trying to make a, a, a different recommendation, as he talked about earlier on. Is it appropriate for me to for him to? No, no, I, I'm just going by the recommendation that I got emailed email to today by Attorney so, Heim, which yeah. is complete opposite of yours. But Attorney Heim, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I, I so. Uh, I've spoken with the uh, police department, uh, the police chief about this, who I think echoes a lot of the sentiments that folks have um, stated here tonight, which is that um, he shares uh, our sense that we want to balance serving uh, community and making sure that people call for assistance when they need it, along with making sure that um, we uh, take the rules and regulations that we place on our uh, license holders very, very seriously. He did not have a specific recommendation with respect to uh, suspension. Um, these are subjective matters uh, and there's not necessarily a uh, straightforward guidance. Um, it's my perspective that with respect to some of the issues that we've talked about with respect to renewal that uh, as the license holder knows renewal is uh, every December um, and that this board can have reasonable expectations with respect to maintenance of property, abidance by rules, things like that, when these licenses are coming up for renewal. So I think that if the board desires to integrate that conversation into this, it's certainly possible, but I do think the major component we're here to discuss is a uh, violation of um, the alcohol policy. And based on the you know, board's practice with respect to other violations um, and illegalities on the premises, Again, while this is not about um, marijuana use generally, it's about marijuana use in the context of a uh, licensed establishment. So my recommendation to the board is a three-day suspension. Um, obviously, the board is free to disagree with me, but that is my recommendation for a first-time offense consistent with the board's previous practice. Mr. Carroll. I'm 
So I, I want to put some other context out there because it seems to me the job of the, the manager president is to set an example for the employees who are working at the establishment. And really, we've, we've discussed now tonight three different controlled substances, alcohol, marijuana, and, t and, and tobacco. Um, I, I sympathize with, with the medical issues, and I'm glad that you've, you know, Mr. Kushnierski has gone through and, and gotten the um, medical marijuana card. However, he didn't abide, you did not abide by the, the laws surrounding the control of that substance. And I think even as we have to hold you to a higher standard, we also have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. I think, you know, we've had very controversial um, discussions about moving forward with mar medical marijuana facilities. In this, this community, we expect and ask for guarantees that rules on the supplier end will be followed, just as we ask alcohol providers to follow rules on the supplier end uh, as far as who is eligible for, for receipt. And it just seems that by bringing um, a, a substance into the establishment for which you are not at that time legally um, you know, in, entitled to, it sets a poor example to employees. And I think as we look at these, the tobacco violations, I think it, that, that's, that's a little bit of evidence that, that, that some of that example perhaps has, has um, filtered down to, to, to the staff. So while we don't have you here on, on um, a hearing regarding underage uh, serving of, of alcohol, it seems to me that this sets a very poor example for the em employees when we're asking, on the other hand, that, that, that you, you strictly follow those, those uh, laws as well as far as provision of, of alcohol in the establishment. So I am inclined to, to support um, the um, <clears throat> recommendation of, of uh, or, or the proposal that council has put out and that the, the chair has, has uh, suggested, but I'm, I'm open to discussion for that. And maybe I'll put it out as a motion for discussion and then we can see if we can con come to some agreement as a board. So I would move a three-day suspension uh, for the violation to commence um, on uh, the day of the week on which the, um, the incident um, uh, occurred, which was a, was a Friday, and to be uh, served uh, within, um, I don't know how, how we do this because there is a, there's an ABCC process. Can we say to be served within a month um, of finalization of the decision? Um, the board has had different practices uh, with respect to the time frame, but I would say the issuance of a formal decision by the board. So I'll have to draft decision, bring it back to this board and vote on it, and then transmit it to the license holder. Okay, a motion by Mr. Kiro. Is there a oh, brief, brief request? Sorry. I'm yeah. just going to say a second for discussion if you want, but that's for, okay. Yeah, on the motion, do you mind separating it into two? One is a finding of a violation, and the second vote, vote is what the punishment is? That's fine. Is that okay, Madam Chair? Because I suspect I can support one but not the other. Okay. Do you want to second just for discussion or no? Or, 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 um, anyone else from the board before I call on? Well, I just want to be clear. We have Mr. Dunn's motion. Oh, first. did you have a motion? I didn't actually make the motion. I didn't hear Mr. him Greeley. say I moved too. That's I'm sorry. Right. I thought you said I moved. Yep. Um, is it okay if I call yeah, on attorney? Is it Panico or Panico? Panico. Panico. I apologize. Attorney Panico. We, o we only ask if it's going to be a, a three-day suspension on a weekend, please don't uh, run it into Thanksgiving weekend. Okay. That would, that would, uh, sir, Mr. Grayley. This motion would call for, he has to do that within the 30-day period of time. So that would be within his control. I'm dying to hear what Mr. Byrne has to say, but I'd like to speak to <laughs> Is it okay that we, no, please. we keep speaking to this even though there hasn't been a second? Is that okay? Oh, second. No, it's second. It's second. It's second. second. Oh, okay. second. Motion by Mr. Curro, seconded by Mr. Greeley for discussion only. Mr. Byrne? No, Mr. Oh, Mr. Greeley. Greeley? Right, well, I, but I'm dying to hear what Mr. Mr. Byrne says because it's two to two right now. <laughs> However, uh, I would, I would, um, I, I would agree with Dan, and I will make that motion if this one does not pass. However, I would, uh, I would ask you to really consider what a three-day suspension of a liquor store is versus a restaurant. A three-day suspension in a restaurant still is a restaurant, but they can't serve alcohol during those three days. Uh, so 
while the standard we have, we have not had a liquor, well, we have had a liquor yeah, store violation. Mm -hmm. Did we suspend yes. for three days? It's been quite some time. Yes. Huh? It's been quite some time. I don't remember. I wasn't we serving out. We did. We did? We did. Yeah. Okay. So I still think a probationary period, because I'm buying the medical um, ex explanation here, um, not an intent to distribute or, or uh, try and get his employees to uh, blow a bone with him or anything. Well, you didn't hear what I stated from the microphone, <coughs> Mr. Byrne, and then Mr. Dunn. Um, or, or did Mr. Dunn have the floor yeah. first? Mr. Dunn? I, I'd be interested. Uh, if Mr. Byrne is still persuadable, I'd like to try to persuade him. <laughs> uh, the reason that I feel that uh, probation is appropriate is because, uh, it is because of the what went wrong, but what was done. I am very comfortable with the three-day suspension on... Uh, when you're sell to underage, because that is exactly the thing that we're trying to stop from happening. It's because it's that's the actual you know danger that we're trying to that, like that is the behavior that we're explicitly trying to control, and we make that policy and we enforce it because we want essentially um, every, all the businesses in town to to be you know essentially afraid of it. We want them to to act in, in that way. Um, this is a very different infraction. <coughs> this is not an underage sale. And uh, I think that to treat it the same is, um, uh, to me, it's, I, I don't think it's appropriate. I think, and I think, about, I think about what actually happened in this case, which is, you know, what there was as a 60 milligrams, or as I heard described earlier, a candy. And that just doesn't, to me, make a business lose 2% um, of its business. And, and I would just reiterate and say a little bit stronger, the reason I went into this establishment is more than six people said to me that what they went in, not this individual before the microphone, the employees behind the uh, counter appeared to be intoxicated or under the influence or otherwise. I did go in on my own and made my own observations. There wasn't any sort of official testing or determination of that, but when I went in, it to me was apparent that there definitely was a basis for people, more than six people, I can think of eight now, what I'm thinking in my head, of uh, Arlington residents and or employees um, that brought this to my attention about the employees who work there under this manager and president, um, whom they had questions about <clears throat> in terms of their, uh, I don't wanna say sobriety. Um, and to me, things trickle down from the top, and I think it, this was a violation and we need to take it uh, seriously. Yes, they didn't, we didn't catch them for uh, serving to um, anyone who was um, under the age of 21. We didn't catch them uh, doing anything else that employees may or may not have been doing, but um, I want to say to my colleagues with all sincerity, I have spoken before, months before this incident and after, even, even with town officials when it was brought to my attention, there is an appeared perceived culture of the employees there um, and uh, what state they are performing their job in there. And I think um, under recommendation, not recommendation, under uh, as town council has suggested could be uh, a punish we could met um, the three day suspension. But Mr. Byrne, you, you're, it's your, Ball's in your court. Yeah, it's, it's good to speak last, I guess. Um, so I, I have a, a few mixed feelings on it. One, I, I think we all realize the seriousness of, of what went wrong here. Um, and, and again, you know, I think that the town's response was, was appropriate at the time. Um, it's definitely a privilege to have one of these um, licenses. Um, and, uh, you know, that privilege was taken advantage of. That being said, um, you know, if, I think Dan mentioned the talking, looking at the results of it. You know, what, what's the best outcome for the town? I think that you know everyone who's on this board wants every single business in town to be successful. Um, that's you know, uh, number one. You know, we have um, you know uh, vacancy issues around town, and, and our goal is to create a business environment where you know those businesses can succeed and excel. Um, and that's why I, I'm going along with. Um, what Dan and Kevin are um, talking about here with the probationary period, uh, potentially with, you know, 
some caveats about uh, potential improvements um, moving forward as we get ready to look at the license um, again for renewal. Um, and one a caveat that I think would be, you know, a really nice thing to throw in there would be, you know, if we maybe work with our health department and public safety department come up with a pamphlet of the services we provide, um, maybe that's something that the store um, would be able to, you know, kind of put out and highlight for us, um, which I think could be a, you know, a, a nice touch and kind of highlight the work that we're doing. Um, so I, I am going to, you know, I, I like the idea of a probationary period. I think it fits um, here, and I think that, you know, that really sets a tone that if, you know, we do run into any circumstances moving forward, that, you know, that this, you know, won't be the case. So, thank you. Okay, first on a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Greeley, I believe, yep, sure. for discussion, um, to impose a three-day suspension. Uh, actually, it was split. It was split. So, for it, there, there were actually, uh, it was a split motion. So, mm -hmm. for us to find, um, to find a violation occurred was the first part of the motion. And then the second part is the actual punishment. Okay, Sorry. I'll take them separate. Um, motion by Mr. Kiro regarding finding a violation occurred, seconded by sure. Mr. Greeley. Yeah. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Abstentions, unanimous vote. Um, I believe the second part of the motion was a three-day suspension beginning on the same day of the week the violation occurred, which we have previously voted, in this case a Friday, by Mr. Kiro. Second by Mr. Greeley again for discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Two to three. So there's no punishment, or would someone like to make a motion to actually punish this individual? God forbid, Mr. Greeley. Yeah, well, you know, um, <clears throat> do I want to punish this individual? Do I want this individual to make sure nothing like this ever happens again? Unfortunately, the evidence you're presenting, I, there's no one, I don't doubt it at all about your own experience there. This gentleman tells us that he's let go a couple of employees. Perhaps those were the ones that were inappropriate the night you were there, but we don't have evidence. We're, we're dealing with the case that we have in front of us. So I move that, um, this, is it the gentleman or the liquor store we're placing on probation, Mr. Uh, Heim. It's the license. Okay. The license. He's the manager and president, so the license. Okay. So I hereby move that this this license, we we is under a probationary period of one year. And should any other violation occur within that year, it would be at least a five day suspension of the license. And second, that we do send. I don't know if I can do this, Mr. Heim, stop me, but our inspectors in there to make it very clear to our president manager what needs to be done to allow this license to be renewed in terms of signage, uh, cleanliness, the other kind of issues. Can I do that? Can I just say, just for myself personally, I'm very uncomfortable with the latter part of that. It, it seems as though it's a quid pro quo. I think first we need to We've established as a violation, we need to indicate what response we need to take to that, and then if there's a separate motion. Okay, if to, you want me to Or if we want to bring it up when he shows up before us in December again, and he can decide well, I to, to honor it or blow it off, he can do that, but I, want I don't want to tie the two, because it seems like, you know, I don't want to appear this, do you know, Attorney I'm saving? I, I do. Um, the, the Inspectional Services already has the authority to do that, Mr. Greeley. Um, and to the extent that there are any violations of things that are not liquor li strictly liquor license violations, things like sign bylaws or other matters, um, those are probative for the purposes of renewals. So they probably can and should be a parallel um, uh, process. Uh, in terms of the probationary period, my understanding is that you're requesting a probationary period of a year with a five-day suspension to be served if there are any violations whatsoever. Um, you could certainly make those contingent, th those violations include things like cigarette sales and things like that um, so that it's very inclusive in terms of what constitutes a violation, but things like sign bylaws and okay. Okay. sanitary things should probably be kept separate for the purposes of discussing terms of renewal and things of that nature. 
if that's all, I'm not sure. I'm going to vote for your motion, Mr. Greeley. What I'm saying is no, we've that's, cited that's, these that's, violations to this president right. manager before, and he's ignored them. Right. And perhaps the appropriate time would be in December when he comes in for renewal. Right. That that's when we take them up. Got it. Where got he it. has learned counsel. Right, right. Okay. Right. I got it. I agree. So I move that this uh, license be placed in one year probation. And if there is any violation, now do we want to include alcohol in there or I mean in uh, uh, tobacco? Can we say any violation? Any that violation? The, this board deems is a violation. All right. Would be an automatic five day suspension at the least. Mr. Grayley's motion. Second. Is there a second? Um, any further discussion? Uh, Attorney Panico, Attorney Hein. If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Begrudgingly aye. All those opposed? Unanimous vote. Thank you very much. And okay, may I address the panel? Certainly. Final remarks. Um, there were a few issues with a few employees, and um, like I mentioned before, some were let go. New employees are, are working. And um, in the past, when um, issues have ar arisen, like uh, there was a problem last year where there was a lot of debris in the back uh, that was coming from the Minuteman Trail, uh, we took care upon ourselves to set up um, cleaning facilities and, and take care of that area. Um, also, the building was uh, tagged, and every time the police came in to let us know, it was taken care of immediately as well. Um, presently, there's an issue with uh, awnings in the front that were uh, milled down by a delivery truck, and uh, we're in the process of waiting for uh, new awnings to get delivered, so that issue has been addressed. I understand the image that Arlington wants to show, and. Uh, you know, I'm on board, and thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next agenda, and thank you, Officer Quad, for your patience and staying with us, and Attorney Heim. Um, agenda item five: licenses, all alcohol license change of stockholder and change of manager. Y plus Y Inc. 303A Broadway. Attorney Wei Jia, Fusion Taste. Is anyone here for that? Uh, he was here. He was here. Uh, I guess uh, I motion to postpone. postpone by second. Mr. John, seconded by Mr. Byrne. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Unanimous vote. Request for a common victualler and wine and malt license. Noodle Market 470, 472 Mass Ave. Juthamus. Oh my goodness. Porn. Wait, I'm going to try it. Porn Su Watanakal. Porn Su Watanakal. Porn Su Watanakal. Tell me how I should have said it. My name is Tutamas Ponsu Watanakun. Watanakun, I apologize. I go close. Thank you. And she's the owner of Noodle Market. And my name is Minta Lim from Lima Social. Thank you for your patience. Um, Noodle Market is in the process of buying a restaurant known as um, Sweet Chili. Could you pull the microphone down to your face? Thank okay. you. Okay, thanks. All right, so Noodle Market is in the process of purchase the business known as Sweet Chili. And we are here to petition to transfer the liquor license from Sweet Chili to the market. And um, um, my client's not going to do any renovation. She's going to change the name to Noodle Market, plus um, change the menu, and it's going to remain a Thai restaurant. So any questions? Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Byrne. Yeah, Mr. Dunn. Um, so thank you very much, and uh, I think you know when you do open, we're, we're going to be very excited to have you in town. I, I am curious, um, you know, going through the packet here, it says that um, the plan review application was incomplete, and have well, you heard from the? And have you heard to you've done that and we taken care that. of it? We did all that. The new, um, the uh, the floor plan and the plan review. Yeah, we submitted that one today. You resubmitted it today. Yes. Okay, so it, it seems like I'm, I'm happy to move approval. I think it will be, you know, subject to the, um, you know, the rules uh, set forth, um, particularly with um, working with the Department of uh, Health here in town to make sure that, um, you know, the food permits issued um, after all the appropriate inspections are done. But thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Second. Uh, motion by Mr. Burns, seconded by Mr. Kiro, Mr. Dunn, and then Mr. Greeley. Uh, so thank, welcome to town, glad to have you. Have you managed um, alcohol sales before? Uh, I used to work in the restaurant, that do it on that, yes. Okay, 
Um, have you talked about what your training program is going to be for your wait staff about alcohol? Yes. The tip. On Can you tell me about the planning? You've what you're going to do? Because right now, after we open the restaurant on that thing, after we got on the staff, I think I'm going to set up a group and ask the person that do on the tip about the alcohol everything come to training on the staff and make them get a taste on that. Uh, could you come closer to the microphone? No one at home can hear you. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, that's good. So it sounds like that's going to be your initial training when you first open. Yes. Um, what will you do when you hire new wait staff going forward? Because right now I put on the application that have someone that already know that, and we're gonna talking about that because I have to renew on the restaurant too. Mm -hmm. That's why they just want to make sure when we're gonna open and before that we're okay. gonna do on that. So um, I'm happy to support your license, but let me tell you something that we've seen happen before okay. with, new with new restaurants. Okay. A uh, new restaurant comes into town and they train everybody and they, about alcohol. Mm -hmm. And then a year goes by or six months or two years go by and a waiter or, or waitress leaves and then someone new is hired. We have to and and you're, hurt, you're in a rush, you haven't, like you, you're short staffed and this new person started and you put them on the floor without any training and that person serves someone underage. So we have had many people standing right there who they said it was a new person, we hadn't trained them yet. Uh -huh. And what is really important is that you develop a training program that you do not just in the beginning, but you do it on an ongoing basis for all of your employees, not this year, not just this year, not just next year, but for every year that you're here, Yeah. okay? I try to do with a new one every time that they come into. Not try. <laughs> will. Not try. I will. I will. will. I will do that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. Greeley? Yes. Um, <coughs> do you have a sample of the Vietnamese beef stew with you? <laughs> no? Not yet right now. <laughs> I'll come and try but it. Whenever that we open, you can come and try a lot of things yeah. on that. Thank you for choosing Arlington. Best of luck. And I hope I can make a good food for all of you guys, too. <laughs> no, no, you will. And um, just to piggyback on Mr. Dunn's comments, just uh, from my own personal sp perspective, whatever you think is appropriate, once a year, twice a year, anything more than that is probably not necessary. And or a new employee, I really think you need to have a sit down, and sometimes it might have to be done on two different shifts. Even if it's people that have been working for you for 10 years, just for your own liability, if you just sit down and just go over real quick, it's two, three minutes, they read this, this is the tips, the alcohol policy, and they sign it again. Um, it, you don't have to do that. I'm, I think what Mr. Dunn was saying, which I'm sort of, in my own way, speaking more on, is that when we have had violations, it's because the case in point that he said, new employee, really rushed, someone said they were shadowing them, but they didn't pay attention. Um, and Arlington is, uh, in my opinion, very active, proactive in terms of going out to all our establishments that have beer and wine, beer, wine, and malt licenses to make sure that, you know, everything's being done appropriately and we're not serving underage um, minors in, in any capacity. So it definitely will happen. So you don't have to do that, but it, it, if I were giving advice to you, if you hire an employee and you say, oh, when I first hired him, he or she went through this and signed off, they know it. Me, from my legal background, I would at least do it like once a year with everybody and or when a new employee comes on, just to make sure that, you know, God forbid you're before this board, you can show, you know, these are the steps I did, or these are the steps I did not take, mm -hmm. and then violations come out. So you don't have to do that. It's just, you know, we're just giving you the nature of the beast of what we've seen um, so come before us. So, but it's your business and you know how to run it. I'm not trying to tell you how to do it, but on a motion by Mr. Burns, seconded by Mr. Caro, any further questions? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck. Thank Good luck. you. Um, is there anyone here for Citizens Open Forum? which I do not believe so, so I'm not going to read the big preamble and go to, if that's okay with my colleagues, agenda item 10. Mr. Chapdelaine, a vote for creation of working group for maintenance of public lands. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the board has been provided a memo by Assistant Town Manager uh, Jim Feeney, but just to, to add a little background to this, 
Uh, I think the board is aware that for some time, bo both preceding and now following the study of the Building Maintenance Committee leading to the creation of the Facilities Department, there has been and continues to be discussion about how that can or will extend to our parks and our, our outdoor spaces. Uh, that discussion has ramped up a little bit with the CPA being in full effect and the CPA committee now hearing requests for a number of park projects. Last year, the Robbins Park uh, upgrade was funded and there's further park uh, projects that they're looking at now. Uh, and several members of that committee started to vocalize an interest in making sure that we are uh, properly maintaining and caring for our parks and open lands. Uh, so the uh, chairperson of the CPA committee initiated the discussion with me. Uh, I agreed that it was probably overdue for us to put together such a study group. Uh, I've put uh, a proposed um, uh, membership of a study group before the board. What I would expect is that um, if the board so chooses to fo um, form this group, uh, meet over the course of the next several months, uh, if possible, make <coughs> some initial recommendations to the board and then to town meeting in the spring, but most likely continue to meet over the course of the year following that too if there's any further um, analysis or recommendations that need to be made. I don't see this uh, making a recommendation similar to the creation of a facilities department, but more li more likely uh, recommending further investment uh, and probably or possibly better coordination between the recreation department and the DPW Natural Resources Division. Uh, but remains to be seen exactly uh, what the group would recommend. But happy to answer any questions and I would ask for favorable action from the board. Mr. Carroll. Um, for, firstly, I'm happy to move uh, approval of the request with just one um, or two caveats. Um, I'd like to recommend that the um, resident at large spot be um, brought to us as an appointment by the town manager for our mm -hmm. approval. That's what was one of my questions. And, and that, the, um, that Mr. Feeney um, serve to convene the initial meeting of, of, of the uh, committee and, and then they can self-organize as they see fit. Motion by Mr. Second. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Byrne. Mr. Greeley? And, and I just wanted to, uh, this includes schools? Uh, Lands around schools, so. Mm. No, I would, I would view this as um, pieces of land under the jurisdiction of the Parks and Rec Commission or Open Space, uh, Open Space Committee Conservation Commission. But what do you think about maybe should the schools, I don't, I mean, it, uh, I'll leave it up to them. You know, if it's not going to be, you know, directly impacting, you know, the area surrounding schools, I, I don't know if we'd need a, another head on the committee, but. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And, and I would agree, the only sort of hot issue for me right now is uh, concession stand, and what I would say to my colleagues and, and to the town manager, if uh, through conversations with the athletic director and the school superintendent um, that they agree with me that perhaps uh, that particular, in my opinion, public athletic recreation use um, can fall under uh, the recreation department, then that would fall onto the town manager's uh, plate. But right now, I don't see that this committee, as much as I'm looking for some relief in that area, um, I'm not looking to this committee right now in its current form on that issue. I'm, I'm hoping I can, to me, the appropriate way is if I can, uh, if the athletic director and the superintendent of schools agree that it, it goes to the recreation department, then I would anticipate this committee would, if, if I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, and I, I guess um, to take a step back from what I said, you know, there will be automatically some overlap because a number of the fields that are adjacent to schools are actually under the jurisdiction of Parks and Rec. So I knew that when I asked the question. Yeah. <laughs> See how safe. So you, you, it might seem as though it is impacting things under the school's jurisdiction, even though it, it isn't. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, no, no, no. I took my new business out on you. Um, on a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Byrne, um, with the understanding that the resident at large, I think I heard that uh, the town manager will be uh, selecting that resident and submitting his or her name to this committee in the future. Uh, any further questions or discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, aye. unanimous vote. Again, to our town manager, a referral from the Housing Corps Administration Downing Square Traffic Study to TAC, Transportation Advisory Committee, for review. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this came to my attention. The Housing Corporation is going through a permitting process with the ARB uh, right now for uh, their proposed project in Downing Square. One of the key pieces of feedback from the public uh, that the ARB wanted more answers on was traffic impacts of the proposed study uh, with the, the challenging intersection that Downing Square is. 
Uh, there is a traffic study that exists um, for Downing Square, and what we're asking tonight is that the board refer that traffic study for tax review and analysis to then provide feedback to the ARB. To be very clear, not for TAC to recommend how to make the intersection better at this time or how to better plan for HGA's proposal, but rather to review and analyze what they've put forward in their traffic study and then give feedback to the ARB. The reason it's before you is I know the board likes to be the gatekeeper of tax workload. Uh, so as you um, have seen in the memo from Laura Wiener from the planning department, she brought it to the TAC meeting. They did agree to look at it, are comfortable giving it a review if this board chooses to forward it to them officially. So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Greerly, seconded by Mr. Byrne. Um, any questions? Uh, only question I would have is uh, if you have an opinion concerning resources that TAC might or might not need, do they feel um, those resources are pretty much contained on the committee <coughs> or um, will they need some sort of, or the planning department, Laura Wiener, uh, outside consultant to effectuate this? So I, I would have expected that coming out of Laura's initial conversation with TAC last week that they would have made me aware of any resources they need, but I will double check that okay. in bringing it to them. And if that's the case, I'm still in support of this, but that, that would be the only question that I have. Uh, on a motion by Mr. Greerly, seconded by Mr. Byrne. Any further questions or discussions? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, unanimous vote. New business, Mrs. Kropelka. Oh. Attorney Hine. Uh, just uh, one piece of new business. As uh, the selectmen are aware, about question number four passed in Massachusetts, which has implications for the town. Um, while um, there's no need to get into all those implications, what I want the board to know is that myself and uh, the town manager, the planning director, and other town staff, including uh, folks from the Board of Health, will uh, be advising the selectmen on what our options are and what the landscape will be in the coming year, year and a half, while regulations are promulgated and things of that nature. And, and just on that, if I could, um, uh, the town manager or town council could identify what, if any, role this board may um, be called upon in the future, and just myself personally, but I know my, all my colleagues would avail themselves of this opportunity, similar to when we um, were trained in, I know I served on the board and Kevin was there, and I think it might have been maybe Tips. not these three other pro colleagues, but when we went over to the police station, there was a Saturday morning seminar, you know me, I don't like extra meetings and I don't like forums or charrettes, but if you see A, there is something that we will need to be weighing and should have knowledge and information on, as well as B, um, some sort of seminar, et cetera, whether through town manager, Arlington Police Department, um, that this board could avail themselves of the opportunity. So if we deem fit that we want to participate, we can be armed with the knowledge. So what I'm saying is if you could define what, if any, role we may have in the future, and if we do have any role whatsoever, similar, to, it was on the Board of Selectmen agenda and we decided not to discuss it because it was a Warren article, but I anticipate it will come before us. So if you with the police chief, Board of Health, or whomever can identify a, a, an appropriate one to two hour or whatever, but I'm, I'm thinking of that alcohol training program that I went with Mr. Greerly and I can't remember who the other colleagues were that was over at the police station like a Saturday afternoon for I two hours. I believe it was Marie and Marianne were with us, I think, at that Okay. Um, if, yes, Madam Chair. So if you could just look into that. I'm not looking for another meeting another time, but I'm just saying I anticipate it might come before us and I'd like to, I, I, I would avail myself of that opportunity and you know how anti-whatever. Uh, I'm sorry, Attorney Heim, I jumped in on your new business. Yep, that, that's good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Town Manager. Um, I have no new business. Mr. Greerly. What? Would you take a week off? <laughs> you don't want to know. Mr. Greerly. <laughs> no, it's a, he does so much. I'm amazed. That, uh, just two quick things. Um, one is that I want you all to mark down the date December 21st, 7.30 p.m. in the town hall. There will be a holiday show performed by the select tones, of which all of you are members the Arlington High School Jazz Band and the Madrigal Singers uh, be there or I'll speak to you. What, what time? Do you know what day? 7.30. And what day of the week that is? It's a Wednesday night. Wednesday 7.30, 7.30 Wednesday night downstairs. Here at town hall. And if you're really going to participate, 
like you used to do. <laughs> All my Wednesdays are booked. That's amazing how that happened. <laughs> uh, the rehearsal is December 15th at 6 p.m. But you don't need to go there to hear me. However, our you town will. manager <laughs> will be doing a solo. That's mm. all I'm going to say. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Last year, he got a standing ovation for his Mac the Knife. OMG. I'll say no more. <laughs> I got to talk to Pearl. And the other thing is, I would like my colleagues to consider this space here, which we have. And I have one recommendation, but I want to, uh, where now we'll be projecting everything over there. Uh, I have a recommendation, but I'd, I'd like to just say to, the, to my colleagues, what can we do to beautify this office and getting rid of that, I think, would be part of it. Every five years, we do the Selectman's Awards, and I think that we could do a very nice display of plaques, which will have the names of, is it five Marine Selectman Awards, six? Five. Five, five different Selectman's Awards and the names of everybody who has won those awards and the upcoming winners of those awards. We could do a very nice display there. That's just one idea. Mr. Byrne. Thank you. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, she'll tell us who speaks next. Um, I would like to thank all of the poll workers, of course, the Board of Selectmen's office. Um, I think that um, I know uh, early voting um, was you know, not an easy tasks to carry out for town staff, but I, I think we saw a really, um, you know, much larger turnout than I was expecting going into the start of early voting. So I, I just want to point out that it was, uh, it didn't happen overnight and it wasn't particularly easy, but um, we're, we, you know, we have a great team here that uh, you know, made it as easy as possible for residents to vote, and that's, a, and that's an important thing. So thank you. Madam, may I add one thing to that? Well, it depends what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a brilliant statement. Could I add that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, uh, that how popular it was. We, we got more early votes than we have had in town elections here, even when uh, overrides, and well, not an override, but uh, so, but how appreciative people were mm -hmm. of having that opportunity. Uh, and so, so we just need to, for four years from today, figure out with Marie how to help her get this done because there were some very tired, cold people down there uh, in, in the hall in terms of running it, but I agree with Stephen. Again, Marie and the staff and all those uh, poll workers did a great job. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to, not the, it's not the official record, but I, they're still working on it. I think we had 9,676 as to right now, we may have a little bit more when they finish with the figures, but that's what we For early voting. For early voting, and it went over big. And that's close to a third of the registered voters. Yep, close to a third. And I know I discussed this at my last new business, and I'm leaving it to Mrs. Kropelka. We will have a report. And the town today. manager. I, I, my personal opinion, I think more than the yeoman's share of responsibility fell largely in part, if not solely, on the Board of Selectmen staff. Again, um, yeah. And if I look at other cities and towns, and I've had just cursory conversations with the town manager, um, but I, I have spoken with the town manager, as my colleagues have, and Mrs. Kropelka is sort of analyzing this and how we best uh, move forward in the future to make sure, um, not to be disrespectful, but I thought, I was thinking that, you know, Selectman's office, you know, supply the the poll workers and um, maybe we need to interface more with the town clerk's office. Um, and I didn't really see that defined. So I have asked the town manager and Mrs. Kropelka to engage in that conversation and come back at a future meeting um, and I'll give you a report. maybe see what other cities and towns did. What, what it is is, in my opinion, and I believe my colleagues, we throw so much stuff on the Board of Selectmen's office. And that was another thing, in my opinion, was pretty much 100% on the selectman's office, you know, with the town manager. I know Mr. Greeley and I would call him, like, get that heat on, um, and it, it did get on. So I, I've asked for, and my colleagues, I believe, have agreed, sort of a, a synopsis and breakdown of that to come back with uh, how we make it run more efficiently in the future and make sure we have all the responsible parties at the table. Yeah. I think you'll have it, Mr. Greeley. Excuse me for that noise behind you. Oh, no problem. Put something in the recycle bin. Mr. Carroll. It's too loud. They stole my thunder. I was also going to thank you for the early voting. Although I have to, I have to compliment Ms. Kapalka too, because I think I spoke to you on October 31st, and you predicted 
10,000, and it sounds like we came in awfully close well, to that number. So I think when it's all done, we might come up with nine, 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 seven, six. So that is an amazing prediction job, and, oh, and uh, definitely more than we you have the pulse of the uh, electorate. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dunn. Uh, repeating the thanks to the poll workers, to the Slackman's office, and to the town clerk. Also, uh, on the same topic, uh, the town manager sent out a letter to all employees on November, on the 10th, and uh, I think that his words were excellent, and I think that they're good for all of us, so I'm gonna read them. Hello all, I'm writing to, to you today in follow up to today, Tuesday's election, and perhaps more importantly, the campaign that preceded it. The tone and rhetoric of the campaign was disturbing to most, regardless of your preferred candidate, and has led to many growing concern that hate and fear and contempt will become the new normal. For whatever role I might play in easing those concerns, I want to provide you all with the following assurances and reminders. First, the town of Arlington as an employer will not discriminate against any individual based on their race, color, religious views, national origin, gender identity or expression, citizenship, age, ancestry, family marital status, sexual orientation, disability, source of income or military status. Our strength lies in our diversity and it should be fostered and supported. Second, the town of Arlington is a diverse community and we value that diversity. We all provide services very well, in my opinion, mine too, to the residents of Arlington, and it is the expectation that those services will be de delivered equitably and fairly without discrimination. Lastly, I want to reassure you, that all, uh, reassure you all that despite all the rhetoric to the contrary, life and work as we know it here in Arlington will go on. We must remain committed to our duties and remember that the residents of Arlington will be looking to us to see how we re react in the weeks and months to come. My request of you is you continue doing the good work that you do, and if the opportunity arises for you to share words of support or even a smile with a resident needs some assurance that you do so. Sincerely, Adam. So I thought that captured um, a lot of what I had to say, and I think that it's a message to the town employees, but I think it's a message to us all in the town and to remind ourselves that we are a town of diversity and that we do value that, and we are going to keep that way regardless. Uh, we've got a great town meeting, we've got a great human rights commission, we've got a great public safety uh, department, we have a number of volunteer organization employees, and uh, we should not lose sight of that. And an outstanding board of selectmen. Uh. On some days. <laughs> <laughs> Who would you like to add? No, Excellent. and, and uh, my, my only other new business is I really want to commend um, uh, the residents of East Arlington as well as the Arlington Police Department uh, we recently had in the news uh, an yeah. a individual um, whom we don't know, you know, any sort of background or motivation. Um, but I was, you know, every now and then when I hear Arlington on the news, I'm like, oh my goodness, again. But then when I heard the news story of a, an individual that, uh, you know, appeared before a resident's home allegedly saying he was affiliated with the FBI, I thought it was a really good uh, community working between the re the residents down there um, notifying the Arlington Police Department as well as an appropriate and, and uh, merited response by the Arlington Police Department to uh, approach this individual and then when I heard of allegedly all the uh, equipment and uh, I don't want to say artillery but um, firearms etc and uh, identifications that this individual posed and how peaceful on all counts uh, that, that this particular incident went down. It really struck me that, you know, this is something that's really working in Arlington. You know, something happened, it happened on a teeny little side street, Lee Terrace in East Arlington has like three or four houses. Uh, the residents felt comfortable enough that they contacted the Arlington Police Department. They felt confident enough that, that they would be taking seriously and the importance of as it should be and the fact to me that this just went so peacefully and, and could have gone really askew um, um, if it wasn't and I wasn't down there and I, I don't profess to be a professional but I think the way um, as well as you know the individual that was apprehended and um, the uh, I don't want to say care that we provided them, but the, the way that this individual was taken into custody and all considerations taken into account, I really have great admiration. Thank you to the residents down there on Lee Terrace, and, but really thank you, and if you could pass on to the Arlington Police Department. When I look at the arsenal of what they showed on television and nobody was physically harmed in, in my opinion, even emotionally, maybe to a minor extent, it really, 
to me, somewhat piggybacking on what Mr. Dunn said in terms of Arlington and what this community looks like, how our residents feel, how our department heads, our first responders, um, nobody even expressed any issue with um, calling and not being taken seriously, not that that's ever happened. But I was really impressed working through the court system, seeing what the end result was allegedly and how that turned out. Mr. Carroll. I'm sorry, thank you, Madam Chair, for mentioning that, because I did forget one important thing that I think is also along that vein. Um, I had the opportunity to drop by the open house that the, the police department mm -hmm. held for the new, the new station. And they did it the, the weekend before Halloween. They specifically invited kids to come in, um, their costumes or, or whatnot. And very many of the officers were conducting tours of the facilities. It wasn't just one. Or, or, or two officers, um, you know, in, in leadership, it was, it was really the, the patrolmen, detectives, and such, and people were just flowing through. And I think that that is is one um, approach to building a, a, you know, true community policing department. I think taking actions like that and holding events like that and welcoming the community in, uh, so they can see the facilities in meet meet the personnel is probably one reason why we have that level of trust that we do. Um, down there, and, and I hope that we can preserve those local values in the face of some of the, the, the discord that we've seen elsewhere in the country. Yeah. Okay, and with that, Mr. Greer. Yeah, I was at the ribbon cutting of that, and it's, uh, it was a nice crowd, and it was great to see the veteran officers who came back. Um, it, was, it was a very nice ceremony. I, I mentioned all of you. Yeah. You too. Thanks. Move to adjourn. Moved by Mr. Second. Greeley, seconded by Mr. Byrne. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Next meeting is my 54th birthday, November 28th, Monday at 7 p.m.